Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's presentation, Human Rights Back to Basics, the Continuing Shift in What Constitutes Discrimination and the Associated Risks, the FASC in Labor, Employment, and Human Rights National Webinar. I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Before introducing myself and our speakers, I'd ask that you please review the information uh, on the next slide. There it is, that's on your screen, and particularly direct your attention uh, to the survey. We value your feedback on our sessions. We'll great, be grateful if you take the time to fill in the survey before you log out of the webinar today. My name is David Wong, and I'm a partner in Faskin's Vancouver office. I'm the leader of Faskin's National Human Rights Practice and co-leader of Faskin's National Labor, Employment and Human Rights Practice Group. My practice includes advice to and representation of organizations in all areas of human rights law, as well in the areas of labor and employment law. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-presenters for today's session, Sarah Graves, a partner based in Faskin's Toronto office. Sarah's practice is focused on employment law, litigation, and human rights. She's a trusted advisor for clients on workplace issues, provides strategic advice on hiring, termination, investigations, reductions in force, employment standards, wrongful dismissals, human rights, including sexual harassment claims and racial profiling, whistleblower claims, accommodation and disability issues. As well, Rafael Buriana, an associate based in Baskin's Montreal office. He specializes in labor law, representing public and private employers. Rafael advises and represents clients in litigation, arbitration, negotiation, human rights, and labor relations cases. Next slide, please. Our outline for our presentation today, uh, we're going to start with a discussion on prima facie discrimination, uh, then move to a discussion on subconscious bias and un unintentional discrimination, then going to move on to a uh, topic of law catching up to culture in the context of harassment, complaints and discrimination, and finally conclude with a discussion about microaggressions. Next slide, please. So the test for prima facie discrimination. Why we're starting here, of course, the idea of what is discrimination is fundamental to human rights protections. And given how long human rights legislation has existed, one might think that the concept of what is discrimination would be settled by now, um, it, given again how fundamental it is to uh, on human rights. The reality is though, as society continues to evolve and, and its awareness of human rights uh, changes, the test for prima facie discrimination and what actually constitutes discrimination, protected discrimination under our human rights legislation evolves itself. And so the starting point for this discussion, again, is the question of what is prima facie discrimination? So <clears throat> for the purposes of that discussion, I'm gonna talk first about a decision from the BC Court of Appeal Gibraltar Mines decision, and this is from this year, 2023. And the context for this discussion is this decision was, was a decision relating to the question of family status discrimination, and specifically the test in British Columbia, which the, the test here is different than it is in other areas of the country. Um, and the, the, the court was, the, the question before the court was a, a distinct one, but the court had to grapple with the question of reconciling family status discrimination and our test in British Columbia and the test for prima facie discrimination. So <clears throat> the starting at, you know, the starting point when we talk about the test for prima facie discrimination is numerous decisions from the Supreme Court of Canada, which have explained the test as one, an individual having a characteristic protected from discrimination two, the individual experiencing an adverse impact, and three, the protected characteristic being a factor in the adverse impact. Next slide, please. So the test, that test, the prima facie test, is well established and has been noted in numerous Supreme Court of Canada's decisions. Uh, however, the, the test for family status discrimination in British Columbia as stated there, a conflict between work and family obligation that amounts to serious interference with a substantial parental or other family duty or obligation on its face raises questions of how can the two be reconciled? Are they different tests? Are they the same? 
And if they are different, then how does that work for the purposes of human rights protections and our question of what is discrimination? Do other areas, do other areas of protected grounds uh, warrant different tests for discrimination or do we have one? So the test for family status discrimination in British Columbia you know, brings that question together and forced the Court of Appeal in 2023 to uh, to deal with it and consider it. Now, the, the, the court was really being asked the question there of whether a change to a term or condition is or is not required for the purposes of our test for family status discrimination in BC. And it found that that change is not required. But again, for these purposes, that's not what I want to focus on. In making that decision, the court had to grapple with that question of this is the test in BC for family status. This is the test for prima facie discrimination. How can the two coexist? Next slide, please. So the court, when it came to that first step of the test, the first step being you know, an individual being a member of a protected group, the court explained that determining for the purpose of the family status test in BC, for determining whether the protected characteristic of family status is engaged, include, it includes the question of materiality. materiality. The parental or family duty must be substantial or out of the ordinary to give meaning to the protected characteristic of family status. So <clears throat> you'll recall from that first slide that the first step of the test was simply does someone, you know, does someone have a protected characteristic under the human rights legislation? The court here, reconciling the test for family status in that test, explained that there's materiality in that first aspect of the test. Now, that has not been recognized, is not generally recognized by the Supreme Court of Canada when it, when it states the test for prima facie discrimination. But it's, welcome, it's a welcome change or a welcome recognition, I'll say, from my perspective, um, because it adds a, a, another layer to the test that's not simply ticking a, a simple box. Next slide, please. On the second part of the prima facie discrimination test, that there be an adverse impact on the individual. When considering that family status test, the court explained the adverse impact must be a serious one. So it did also discuss the test in Ontario and said, in Ontario, that means resulting in a real disadvantage to the relationship and impact the relationship in a significant way. Uh, and, and explained that any other conclusion would be unworkable in an employment context. So again, turning back to the prima facie test itself and the second part, of requiring an adverse impact, the court explained, at least for the purposes of the family status test, it's not just an adverse impact. It's an adverse impact that, that is a serious adverse impact. Um, and so it's qualified it a bit. Again, you know, a welcome change from my perspective when considering what actually constitutes discrimination and what we mean by protection under human rights uh, legislation. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> summarizing when it comes to family status discrimination and uh, prima facie discrimination, the Court of Appeal explained to establish prima facie adverse impact discrimination as a result of a conflict between work requirements and family obligations, an applicant must establish that their family status includes a substantial parental or other duty or obligation. They've suffered a serious adverse impact arising from a term or condition of employment and that their family status was a factor in the adverse impact. Comparing that to the prima facie test as uh, set out by the Supreme Court of Canada of there being uh, the an individual being a member of a protected group, having a protected characteristic, the individual suffering an adverse impact and their characteristic being a factor in the adverse impact. You can see again, in particular, the first and the second step have there's there's some addition to it. Uh, to the test, at least for the purpose of, of the family status test in BC. Now, does this mean that the test for prima facie discrimination uh, for all areas uh, protected by human rights legislation is now amended to include these other elements? Uh, no, not necessarily, uh, though it is a wedge um, for arguments to be made that you know, the test, if the test is one test for all protected grounds, then there needs to be other things considered beyond the, the simple test as it's framed by the Supreme Court of Canada. 
as I have said several points there, I welcome that change because from my perspective, human rights legislation is there to protect against certain types of discrimination. And it's not a blanket prohibition against any discrimination of any kind. And there's circumstances and context that needs to be considered when deciding whether or not conduct that's taken place is in fact discrimination that we that we want to protect against in the context of our human rights legislation. The question of discrimination, in my opinion, is a nuanced question. It's not a simple mechanical test, a test that needs to be, three boxes need to be ticks, ticked in order to find discrimination. There's a lot more nuance to it that should be considered. So I welcome you know, a decision like this that opens the door for consideration of you know whether discrimination has or has not occurred, uh, including more than simply ticking boxes. I should add, of course, you know, when we're talking about prima facie discrimination, that's the starting point when it comes to human rights legislation. Of course, if there is prima facie discrimination, it can still be justified and, and not constitute a breach of human rights legislation if uh, there's a bona fide occupational requirement or justification for the conduct. Next slide, please. So I've started out talking about the prima facie discrimination test in the context of family status, and that's a specific ground that's quite unique and arguably different than the rest. So whether, again, that decision will apply to other protected grounds is yet to be seen. But there are other examples where tribunals and courts have considered other things than simply just ticking the boxes on the prima facie test. And so I'll go through a, a few of those examples here. The first is a single instance of alleged discrimination. So the BC Human Rights Tribunal, for example, there's a number of decisions out there in which individuals, complaints have been made of discrimination where one employee, for example, has made a racial slur in, in, towards another employee on one occasion. Often it's in the context of an argument between those employees and, and something happens. And then in that context, the individual makes a racial slur or makes some comment about a protected ground. Uh, and then a human rights complaint is filed. And our tribunal here in BC has said that in some of those circumstances, and again, it's contextual. So sometimes it can be discrimination prohibited by our human rights code, but in some circumstances, it's not despite the fact that, for example, it would be a racial slur having been made. So looking at the prima facie discrimination test, clearly, if somebody makes a racial slur, it would be prima facie discrimination. It would tick those three boxes. But our tribunal has said that it need, that test needs to be applied contextually. And so in those sort of circumstances, again, where the, you know, it, it may be an argument that's happening between the two uh, there may be mitigating circumstances that that conduct isn't what we, in, you know, intend to be protected under our human rights legislation. It's not what we intend is to be discrimination uh, that's prohibited and that should go to the tribunal uh, for adjudication. So there's one example of the prima facie test not being applied mechanically. Again, I welcome that and instead context being considered. Another example uh, with our tribunal here in BC are, are cases involving entitlement to benefits. And often that will come up in, in the context of an employee who doesn't necessarily have children or doesn't have another family, a spouse. And the benefit that the employer is providing uh, extends to family members. So for children or for a spouse or something like that. And the, the individual files a human rights complaint alleging that you know they're not getting that same benefit that these other employees who have children or who have a spouse are getting and that's discrimination against them and again you know if you apply the prima facie test mechanically you can tick those three boxes but our tribunal has in those circumstances again explained the contextual application of that test needs to happen that's not necessarily discrimination uh, that is intended to be protected against by our human rights code and has dismissed complaints on that basis. Finally, when it comes to, to you know that this point on, on the, the test and 
contextual application. I'm going to just briefly touch on the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada and Stewart and Elk Valley Coal Court. And I first note that that's a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada reviewing a decision of the Alberta Human Rights Commission. And as, effectively, at the end of the day, upholding that decision and saying there was nothing to be disturbed there when it came to their findings of fact and evidence. But what happened in that case as a refresher, there was an employee who uh, got into an accident uh, and had been found to have used cocaine before they got onto that accident at work. And then subsequently uh, came forward and said that they had an addiction and that that had impacted on their behavior and why they got into the accident. The employer had in place a policy that stated that anyone with substance abuse issues needed to come forward in advance of an accident happening and disclose it. And because the employee had not done so, the employer terminated their employment on that basis. And so the question before the Alberta Human Rights Commission was whether that termination was discriminatory. For these purposes, I'm not going to get into a lot of that analysis, but I just want to note that the Supreme Court of Canada, the majority upheld that decision, said it was not, it was, it was not going to disturb the commission's decision. It wasn't discrimination. But the minority of the Supreme Court of Canada explained or stated that the majority's decision necessarily meant that they weren't applying the prima facie test by ticking those three boxes and instead must have taken some other approach to the prima facie test, which you know, the minority was, was stating in a way, you know, with disagreeing with what they had done. But again, from my perspective, to the extent that the court took a contextual approach, it's welcome. Finally, on, on the topic of, of context of prima facie discrimination, I just want to mention uh, the contextual approach that the Supreme Court of Canada has taken to the question of jurisdiction and the scope of the Human Rights Code. And that comes from the decision in Shrink, where the Supreme Court of Canada, on a question that you would think would be black or white, is, is something within the jurisdiction of a tribunal? Is it within our human rights legislation or not? Um, that the Supreme Court of Canada has said a contextual approach to that question needs to take place. So if context can can apply in a black or white scenario like that, then certainly it can and should apply when we talk about what do we actually mean by discrimination, what the whole underpinning of what our human rights legislation is. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. So to conclude this section and of what do we mean by discrimination and where is the test for discrimination currently at and where is it going? Uh, you know, in my view, there is sufficient authority out there and certainly the, the recent decision of the BC Court of Appeal opens the door to more recognition of the nuance to the question of what is discrimination and as well to the consideration of context, which again, you know, I welcome. Now, am I saying that the courts and the tribunals all agree with that and are all going to take that into account when they apply the prima facie test? Not necessarily, but I think that it, you know, it opens the door to arguments that discrimination is more than just ticking those boxes. It's far more nuanced, there's far more context. And why is that important? Well, it's helpful in avoiding trivial conduct being found to be discrimination. And again, it allows a more considered assessment of challenging circumstances. It's not going to convert what would obviously be discrimination, discriminatory conduct into non-discriminatory conduct, but hopefully what it will do is avoid some of the, you know, more trivial issues going before the tribunal um, and taking up resources that should be used for more important questions of discrimination. So this is arguably, maybe, hopefully, a bit of a good news story for organizations. Uh, my bad news story will come later. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over now uh, to Raphael to talk about the situation in Quebec. Thank you, David. So hello, everybody. Um, yes. Yeah, so when we look at Quebec, unfortunately, as of now, the basically the, the what's happening is not necessarily positive for for you. Um, but we can start by by going to the next slide to see what the test is um, in Quebec. So Quebec's Charter of Human Rights lists the grounds for discrimination in its section 10 though and and what you will see from that listing is that family status is not a ground for discrimination 
And um, contrary to the other provinces of Canada or some of them and Canada's charter, uh, the grounds listed in the Quebec charter have been interpreted as being exhaustive. So one would believe that because family status is not listed, family status is not protected. So according to the, to the charter, unless a ground listed in the slide is specifically violated, there would normally not be a finding of discrimination. And even if somebody believes that they have been discriminated with regards to one of those grounds, this discrimination must have occurred in one or another of the situations listed in the charter. For example, the refusal to sign a contract, the refusal to hire or the termination of an employee in order for there to be a finding of discrimination. Again, if discrimination takes place outside of the situations provided in the charter, uh, there would not be a finding of discrimination. So the, the Quebec Charter um, does not provide a protection against all forms of discrimination or against discrimination in all situations. In the second uh, bullet of that slide, uh, you have the conditions for prima facie discrimination, uh, which requires a distinction, exclusion or preference based on one of the grounds above and which has the effect of nullifying or impairing the right of, of the individual. So once those conditions are met, the individual will have prima facie demonstrated discrimination and it will be to the other party to demonstrate that either there was a defense or that the situation is not uh, discriminatory for another reason. If we go to the next slide, um, I said that that the the, the criteria um, for the, in the charter are, are exclusive and exhaustive. Now, in Ward, the question that was before the Supreme Court uh, was one of the competence of the Human Rights Commission and the Supreme Court uh, quite uh, quite clearly uh, explained to the Human Rights Commission here in Quebec that they must uh, make a more thorough analysis before deciding to take a case forward. Uh, just to summarize those case th that case very quickly, um, this is by the way a very public matter here in Quebec. Whoever uh, was living here obviously heard about that case. Uh, so Mr. Ward is a comedian, and he made a joke. Uh, in one of his sketches about one of uh, one one uh, child, uh, Mr. Gabriel, who had a physical impairment. Now, this child was a public figure, and he had notably sang before the Pope. He had videos on YouTube, etc. The commission uh, sued Mr. Ward, alleging that Mr. Gabriel had been subject to discrimination because the joke had been made by Mr. The joke made referred specifically to Mr. Gabriel's physical impairment. The Supreme Court considered that the Human Rights Tribunal had found that Mr. Gabriel was the target of jokes due to his fame and not to his disability, and therefore the case could not be successful. And as we saw before, in the grounds of discrimination, fame is not one of them, so the case could not succeed. It could be that Mr. Gabriel was subject to defamation, but it's not the commission's, um, it's not in, in the commission's uh prerogative to file a case for defamation. So essentially what the Supreme Court did in that case is uh, tell the Human Rights Commission that their interpretation of the charter was likely too broad and that their scope of action is limited to discrimination case. This was, I guess, a good reminder to the commission that their scope of action is not infinite. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that um, the tribunals have not necessarily or the commission has not necessarily gone in that uh, in that um, that way so we saw that family status is not protected and then we have a decision from 2017 from the court of appeal that concluded that uh, family status is not enshrined in the Charter of Human Rights of Freedom, but that certain protections may never but the last be available if the discrimination is based on sex or pregnancy. In that case, um, there was a negotiation of a collective agreement which concluded with a 2% premium for all hours worked. The union claimed that that 2% should be given to employees on maternity leave uh, even when they're away. If not, it would constitute discrimination. So the court uh, 
reiterated that uh, family status is not protected, but because the the, the collective agreement uh, was discriminatory in the case of uh, individuals who were on a maternity leave and pregnancy is covered in the charter, there was discrimination by the state. Um, so this and in this case, the Court of Appeal confirmed that there was a discrimination, but not on the grounds of family status, which is not protected. If we go to the next slide, however, uh, we'll see again that parental status is not protected in Quebec at first. In 2010 and 2013, the Court of Appeal comes to the conclusion that parental status is not included in any of the grounds covered by the Charter, including civil status, because uh, unions uh, often tried to have the fact that somebody's on a parental leave, have them um, re receive the same benefits as if they were at work or in a maternity leave. So in those cases, um, an empl employees had lost certain rights, the right to live in an establishment with a cheaper uh, rent because uh, they were at work and um, they benefited from that reduced uh rate for their for their apartment while they were um, on maternity leave but did not once they started their parental leave and so all tribunals the the arbitrator the superior court and the court of appeal all concluded that the fact that the person was a parent is not a right protected so one could imagine that family status once again is not um, a ground that's protected in the 2013 decision the Court of Appeal comes to the same conclusion, comes to the conclusion that the employee was only available to work during certain hours because she had to take care of her child and concludes that this is not a ground that's protected because the mere fact of being a parent is not a right protected in the Charter. So once again, we have decisions that quite clearly state that family status is not a ground that's protected uh, in the charter. However, if we go to the next slide, there's a recent decision from a tribunal that concluded that an employee was subject to discrimination based on civil status because she was terminated during a parental leave. Um, so uh, the, the, the tribunals, the lower tribunals seem to have shifted once again towards a more inclusive and a more uh, broad interpretation of what the Charter protects, despite the Court of Appeal, despite the Supreme Court decisions that's, you know, that are quite clearly stating that the Charter has, even though it has to be interpreted broadly, it's limited in what um, is protected. So in this case, um, the employee was terminated, allegedly terminated for economical reasons, and the employee had been on four maternity leave and four parental leaves during her employment. As I said before, she was terminated during the fourth parental leave, so she was no longer in her maternity leave, which would have been protected by the Charter. The arbitrator confirmed that the criteria of sex or pregnancy, uh, which are listed in the Charter, did not apply as the employee was no longer pregnant at the time of termination and was no longer in maternity leave. However, the arbitrator concluded that the fact that the individual was a parent is included in civil status, ignoring the prior decisions of the Court of Appeal. The tri tribunal therefore concludes that the employee was prima facie discriminated against owing to her role as a mother. And the arbitrator then looks at whether or not the employee is able to prove that the termination was owed to an economical reason and finds that the employer did not meet that burden. The termination of the employee is therefore annulled and the employee is reinstated in her position. So the shift that we see, as I said before, is that decision makers once again appear to be generous in the interpretation of the charter, despite big decisions or decisions from the higher tribunal of Canada or Quebec reminding the commissions or arbitrators or tribunals uh, of the express uh, limitations of the charter. If we move to uh, the next slide, we'll find what uh, is usually seen by employers or by um, or, or by companies as a possibility to make a distinction uh, on an, for an employee or for a person when they come to contract with them, uh, which we find at section 20 of the charter. We have uh, the, the right of, an, of a person um, 
to refuse or exclude a person based on the aptitudes or qualifications required. So this, again, has been interpreted quite um, against employers or against companies or against people who would otherwise be discriminating a person in order to give the highest of uh, protections to individuals who are uh, who would otherwise be discriminated against. So if we move to the next slide, we'll see a very recent case. Um, and the reason why uh, I, I decided to speak about this one is because the, the standard that is discussed in that case uh, didn't really make any, um, there, there never was a problem with regards to this standard in the past. And uh, firefighters, it's the case of a firefighter who is colorblind and is not able to distinguish green from red colors uh, perfectly. And he was therefore not hired as a um, as a firefighter by the city of Quebec. So in, in the course of this uh, individual's uh, hiring process, um, he uh, failed the color test and he obtained only 70%, which was considered as a, as a failure. But even then the city decided to retain a doctor to evaluate the individual's condition and see if there was a possibility to accommodate that individual. The doctor considered that the condition would be permanent and, and that the employee would never be able to complete the tasks, requiring that he's perfectly able to make a distinction between red and green. And then a, a second test was ordered by that doctor, a uh, different test with a different uh, doctor in order to determine again if the employee could be accommodated. That test was again failed by the employee and one would likely consider that at that point the city would just stop its process and in invite the employee to apply to a different position or see if they can accommodate him in another position than firefighters. But at that point, doctors got together and determined where uh, whether the employee could work or not. And the results were that the employee had an incompatible condition with the position of firefighter and his uh, candidacy was therefore rejected. So the, the tribunal wants to determine if the standard requiring that a firefighter is able to distinguish red from green is rationally related to the employee's execution of these tasks, which it concludes positively. We easily understand why such a rule exists to make sure that the firefighters are able to make such a distinction when they're fighting a fire, both for their own safety and for that of, of others. Now, with regards to the second criteria, is the standard reasonably necessary to the accomplishment of the legitimate work-related purpose? The court noted that the medical information on which the court relied was not incorporated in the law. It came from a doctrinal authority from the medical professionals. So courts noted that the employer apparently requested an employee, a firefighter, to have 100% at those tests and noted that it appeared unreasonable. The court then granted the firefighter's application, and here comes the, the, the tricky part. It noted that the firefighter worked as a firefighter in another city before um, he applied for that position at the city of Quebec. So the court considered that the employer should have met with the employee and with the firefighter, the candidate, and given him the chance to prove that he was able to complete the task of, in, of his employment in a way that was safe for him and others despite his condition. Now, this is where it changes because usually when you have doctor's um, conclusions that a person may not uh, follow, a, uh, complete the tasks of his employment, uh, usually it, it could meet, be, meet the criteria to refuse to hire the employee. Uh, and in this case, what they took into consideration was not the fact that the, there was a conflict between doctors where uh, the individual's doctor concluded that the employee was um, able and another, employer, another, another doctor concluded that he was not uh, able to perform the tasks of his employment. It's a case where they took into consideration and, and told the employer that he should have taken into consideration the fact that he worked in another employment and didn't have a problem. So whatever accommodation or if if another employer before you do, does not uh, 
uh, apply the rules correctly or does not apply them at all, it could have a role to play in whether or not there would be a finding of discrimination in the course of your uh, employ your hiring of that candidate or during their employment or in the course of the signing of an agreement or a contract. Um, so the, the burden that is put on companies or, or on employers appears once again to be greater than what it was uh, before. So if we move to the next slide, you'll see what the court order. And it, again, we're, we're before the tribunal, the human rights tribunal here in Quebec. And one of the orders that they make is that the city hires the employee as soon as a position is opened, uh, which again is something that's quite um quite particular in a case such as this one. And they also ordered the payment of the difference between what the employee work uh, earned in his position in the other city and he, what he would have made if he had been hired by the city of Quebec. So if we move to uh, the slide after that, uh, we'll have again a quite particular case regarding accommodation that's again, putting a burden on the employer quite high uh, which appears to be what the, the, the Human Rights Tribunal here in Quebec is, is doing uh, recently. So in this case, so we all know that when an employee has a handicap, uh, it needs, he needs to be accommodated up to the, to, to, to the point where it's undue hardship is, is met. When an employee is sick or on maternity leave, et cetera, it requires accommodations. And those are the typical uh, situations that we see on a daily basis. Now, this case concerns the treatment of employees who are subject to a discriminatory remark, whether made to them or on in their presence, and who then return to work, either shocked or not from the comment they heard. So in this case, the employee worked in a glasses company and a client made a joke regarding the employee's race in general and did not make a joke about the employee herself. That joke was also not made to the employee, but to the employee's manager. But the employee uh, who was of uh, who was covered by a grounds for discrimination heard the joke. The manager looked at the employee to see if the employee was um, in in any way shaken or appeared shaken, and and it doesn't didn't seem to be the case. Later that day, during a dinner, the manager talked about an anecdote regarding her son-in-law, which is of the same race as the employee. And at that time, the employee who had no reaction at the first comment criticized uh, the remark made by her manager during the meal. The next day, the manager apologized to the employee and reiterated its expectations toward the employee's performance, told her that she was expected to have a positive attitude towards employees and clients and that she should be uh, working professionally. The employee confirmed that she would do her work correctly and professionally and just stated that she no longer wanted to take part in the team building activities, which was granted. At the same evening, the employee wrote a message on her Facebook page expressing the fact that she was ill at ease with uh, the situation she had lived. In her message, she did not expressly name her employer or the manager or the de details of the incident. The employee was terminated the next day because the employer believed her behavior to be unacceptable, uh, owing to the fact that she had told that she would be professional and went on her Facebook um, page and wrote a comment that was uh, criticizing her manager. Um, in court, the employer stated that if the employee had returned to work and worked correctly during the day, she would not have been terminated. and. Again, the tricky part arrives here. The tribunal concluded that there was discrimination where the employee's working condition or employment is terminated or modified owing to that employee's reaction to a discriminatory remark. The tribunal noted that the employer could ask the employee to work professionally after such an event, but noted that the employer had a duty to accommodate the employee by giving her the time required to return to her senses. So once again, such a decision appears to make the employer's burden in a case of discrimination harder to meet uh, because usually accommodation would appear after a demand from an employee. For example, an employee would say, following this event, I would require a leave or I, I want to have a break. 
and then the employer would have to accommodate that. But in an event where the employee confirms that they do want to return to work and they do want and they will work professionally, uh, we still put on the employer burden to um, accommodate that person. Um, <clears throat> So accordingly, once again, the companies uh, ought to be more careful when it comes to making a decision shortly after an act of discrimination occurred uh, or an alleged act of a discrimination occurred. This could also require employers to put employees on leave, uh, which could also ironically in certain cases be seen as discriminatory or, or otherwise giving persons time to return to their senses without having any true information as to how long it would take the employee to get back to their senses or the conditions uh, that they have to create in order for the employee to be able to return to their senses. In this slide, you see the, um, the conclusions of the tribunal, which ordered the, the payment of damages, and also uh, that the company amends or creates a policy against discrimination, uh, which in this case, the company did not have, so it, they had to create a policy, uh, give it to all their employees and give a copy, a copy to the commission. So the consequences of such decision uh, include the, uh, the evaluation of an employee's performance. In the evaluation of an, an employee's performance, you would usually consider that once the employee is back to work, unless there's some limitation, you're going to expect 100% from that person. If the evaluation is made shortly after a discrimination act uh, against that individual, then the evaluation could have either to be postponed or to have to be taken into consideration uh, how the employee could feel. And uh, also, this case reiterates that reasonable accommodation does not only exist in the cases of uh, maternity leave or pregnancy or sick leaves, etc., but in any regard with any of the, the, the grounds listed uh, in the charter. So this being said, I return uh, the, 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 my voice to uh, David for some conscious bias and unintentional discrimination. Thanks very much, uh, Raphael. It's always interesting to hear uh, what's happening in Quebec and how things are similar or how things are the same. And uh, from that uh, presentation, I understand, you know, in some ways there's similarities with this shift that's taking place. So before I get into this topic, I would just um, uh, ask if you have any questions please feel free to submit them. Um, we anticipate we will have some time at the end uh, if we have uh, some questions to answer. So if you have some that you would like uh, answered about what we're talking about today, then please do feel free to submit them uh, as we go. Moving on to the topic of subconscious bias and un unintentional discrimination. And what I, you know, when I, when I said earlier, uh, this is bad news for organizations, um, you know, I, I, it's not necessarily bad news for the organizations. It does create increased risk of liability. And, and of course, there's, you know, that's a downside. But, you know, again, it's more of a shift in awareness. And, uh, you know, there's some good lessons for organizations to take from this discussion that will, you know, hopefully take uh, once I've gone through um, this, this topic. Next slide, please. Um, so to start this topic, I'm going to talk about a decision of the BC Human Rights Tribunal in Campbell and Vancouver Police Board. It's a 2019 decision, and I've talked about it before in some of these presentations, so you, some of you may have heard about it, and I don't intend to spend a long time on it, but I do think it's helpful for setting the, 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 the uh, table for the, the next case that I will be talking about and for the discussion about subconscious bias and, and unintentional discrimination. In this case, it was a human rights complaint filed by uh, a mother, an Indigenous mother of, of an individual. She, she witnessed her son being arrested by the police. And it was about, the complaint was about the interaction she had with the police and how the police had treated her in those circumstances. And she had alleged that that treatment was discriminatory. And the police, you know, in that interaction didn't say or do anything overtly discriminatory. They didn't, you know, no racial slurs were made and no comments like that. 
So it was a question really of whether their conduct was, you know, was it was it systemic discrimination against this individual in, in context. The tribunal explained that in most racial discrimination complaints turn on an inference. And the question is whether an inference of discrimination is more likely than the explanation for the conduct. And the reason why, you know, I wanted to touch on this point at this stage of the presentation before we get into the next case is obviously who is going to make that determination of, of an inference? It's going to be the tribunal. And it's not a question of does the respondent, you know, did the respondent mean to discriminate? Did they do anything intentionally to discriminate? None of that's going to matter. Uh, and none of that really, it, it's not what the respondent wants or what the respondent says or what the respondent intended. It's what the tribunal, or the, the adjudicator, the court of the tribunal, what they think and what they feel and whether they think there's an inference should be drawn based on the evidence that's there, which obviously creates some challenges, you know, for respondents when looking at these kind of questions of, you know, where's the inference going to go? Where's the line? Um, next slide, please. So in that case, the tribunal found that there was discrimination when, you know, the social context was taken into consideration. So this, you know, Indigenous mother, in the context of, you know, the, the systemic discrimination Indigenous people have faced specifically as it relates to policing and those sorts of things, when all of that was considered, the tribunal was satisfied and, and was willing to draw that inference that uh, discrimination uh, had taken place, despite the fact, again, there was no overt comments made. Tribunal explained the facts of many race-based complaints can only be properly understood within their broader social context, context in large part because individual acts themselves may be ambiguous or explained away, but when viewed as part of the larger picture and with an appropriate understanding of how racial discrimination takes place may lead to an inference that racial discrimination was a factor in the treatment of an individual received. So, with that understanding of the inference that the tribunal is going to draw, uh, I'll now move on to the next case. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a recent decision this year from the tribunal um, in Mema in the city of Nanaimo. Now, before I get into it, I will say that this, I understand that the respondent in this case uh, does intend to file judicial for judicial review of the decision and may already have done so. Um, but uh for now this decision stands and i think it's it's you know it's a very notable one for organizations to be aware of and it illustrates the tribunal's approach to these kinds of questions really well in this case uh, the complainant was a cfo of the city of nanaimo um he was black and you know, originally from africa and in his role as CFO, of course, there were you know, numerous financial transactions and other things that were taking place. And uh, there were concerns raised relating to some of those financial practices of the CFO. One of the senior accountants in the department, who was noted by the tribunal as being a white woman, um, and had been there for quite some time, was experienced, was concerned about some of these practices and drafted a misconduct report. And what she did there was she set out all of the concerns she had. She had gone through and, and based on the information she had, which wasn't everything, uh, but she outlined all of the concerns she had with respect to the CFO and, and what was taking place. The, the city took that report, considered it, reviewed it, and ultimately decided to terminate the employment of the CFO, in large part because of what was set out in that misconduct report. The ex-CFO then filed a human rights complaint and claimed that the termination was discriminatory. The tribunal first considered that misconduct report and said there was no express or intentional racial, racial discrimination by that senior accountant. So she had in good faith gone and, and drafted this report and that the author of the report, that senior accountant, had a sincere belief act, that she was acting in line with uh, her training and her principles. But from the tribunal's perspective, that misconduct report was informed by racial stereotypes. 
and so so what the the tribunal said was uh, that they wanted the the comment uh, sorry that the the senior accountant sincerely believed she was acting in line with her training and ethical principles in respect of the expected behavior of a CFO. Uh, the tribunal explained that they had reviewed this insidious ways that racial bias lives in many of our subconscious, and it lives there not necessarily because we seek it or choose it to give it space, but because, as courts and tribunals have recognized time and again, it's planted there by the systems in which we all exist. So it was a finding that the senior accountant, there was no intent. They thought they were doing what was right. You know, they, they, there was no question of any of that, but... Despite that, that misconduct report was informed by racial stereotypes. Now, the tribunal then said, this case is not about uh, the, the conduct of that senior accountant. It's not a complaint against them. It's a, it's a complaint against the city. So now we have to consider whether the city's conduct is discriminatory. Next slide, please. So in that regard, the tribunal said and noted that the city's decision was based on the report, that misconduct report. Now the city, again, there was no overt discrimination. There was no, you know, conscious bias that the city was applying. There was nothing considered a, with respect to the CFO's race when the city decided to terminate. The city instead had based it, the decision largely on this misconduct report that it had received from the senior accountant. But because that report was informed by racial stereotypes and discriminatory, the city's decision to terminate was therefore also discriminatory and contrary to the human rights legislation. And so the, the, the one, one note I guess I'll make too in the decision, the, the tribunal noted that uh, it was discouraging that the, the city in that case had argued in the context of a non-discriminatory non explanation for its conduct that it knew the complainant and another employee were black when it hired them, and similarly with another employee when it offered her employment. Um, as the complainant argued in their reply to that argument, the tribunal acknowledged that um, the submission made by the respondent channels the fallacious belief that proximity to blackness immunizes white people from having attitudes that are rooted in racism or from doing racist things. The complainant submitted again that just because a black person is hired doesn't mean that the terms and conditions of their employment cannot be affected because of their race in part or in whole. So the tribunal wasn't impressed with the argument put forward by the respondent that, well, we hired somebody who's black, so therefore, you know, we weren't discriminating against them on the basis that they were black. Not surprising. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, and next slide, please. The tribunal awarded over $500,000 in wage loss, and the, the, the complainant was actually seeking more than that, um, $50,000 in injury to dignity damages, and over $10,000 in expenses. So a very expensive uh, lesson for the city, especially when you consider that, again, the city did not engage in any conduct that it understood or thought was discriminatory. Uh, and that even the senior accountant who had drafted that misconduct report wasn't aware that anything that she was doing was wrong, thought she was doing what was right, but ultimately was, was underpinned by racial stereotypes. Next slide, please. So, so before I turn it over to Sarah, just to conclude on this topic, why does it matter? What, what's the lessons that we can learn from this and what can we do? As an organization, I think that the message coming from you know this this case in particular is the importance of you know unconscious subconscious bias training for all individuals within an organization. And why is that important? Well, one, it's important obviously to try and avoid individuals from you know being motivated by their subconscious bias or taking action uh, based on racial stereotypes, just like the senior accountant did here. Now, obviously, you know, subconscious bias training is not necessarily going to stop that from happening altogether, but certainly it will help and hopefully prevent at least some of the occasions where that might take place. Further, it will also give an organization at least some mitigating circumstances, some something that it can point to to say it's doing all that it can to try and eliminate, you know, the, the subconscious bias within its workplace. 
uh, if a complaint were filed. Secondly, it's, it's important for organizations to critically consider reports, recommendations, anything like that, that, that come forward that, you know, have possible unintentional discrimination or that might have been motivated by stereotypes without people knowing. So not just blindly accepting what's put before them in terms of a report or a recommendation, but instead using a critical eye and being aware of you know, subconscious bias and, and what might or might not have taken place. Um, so, you know, essentially, again, this, the city was, was on the hook for just blindly accepting that report. And instead, taking that critical eye, I think, will be uh, very important for organizations to do, especially as the law continues to shift. With that, I'm now going to turn it over to Sarah to talk about uh, law catching up to culture. Hi, everyone. Um, I think over the last few years, um, we've seen that there have been an increase in various social and cultural movements that have resulted in an increased national conversation about issues such as sexual harassment, uh, systemic racism, unconscious bias, and microaggressions. So as employment lawyers, we have seen that these discussions are not only impacting the workplace, but they're also impacting the discussions and the findings in case law. So we thought it would be interesting to see how these increased discussions are being reflected in recent case law. Next slide, please. I think we can all acknowledge that law, so statutes and case law, uh, often lags behind developing social and cultural understanding. But in the area of employment and, and in the area of employment law, we're seeing signs that case law is catching up. So the first thing we're seeing increasingly is that there's a recognition that dated precedents are just that. So using a dated precedent is not going to be persuasive uh, and can actually be very unhelpful. For example, there was an appellate case when that was reviewing an arbitrator's decision on the standard of unreasonableness. And this reviewing body found that reliance on precedents that did not reflect current understanding of what was appropriate in the workplace led the decision to be unreasonable and it was overturned. In general, we're also seeing a shift in the way courts and adjudicators approach and understand issues involving discrimination and harassment in some of these cases. So as I said, we thought it would be useful to look at some examples of case law that shows that shift in approach, that shift in understanding. And we're going to look at four areas. So cases discussing shop talk and locker room environments cases that discuss the increased expectations of employers and employees. We'll look at the concept of welcomeness, and then we will also look at microaggressions. Next slide, please. The first case that I want to talk about is an arbitration decision, the Levi Strauss case that's on the slide. So in this case, there was a verbal altercation between two unionized co-workers, a white employee aggressively directed racial slurs, slurs towards his black co-worker. And this, witness, this incident was witnessed by several racially and ethnically diverse employees, uh, and this employee was subsequently terminated for violating company policies. So when challenging this termination at arbitration, the union argued that the conduct amounted to shop talk. So which, as we all know, historically in the arbitral context had attracted lesser discipline. Um, rather than what the employer argued was egregious workplace harassment justifying termination. Next slide, please. So here, the arbitrator rejected the union's proposition that the employee's racist statements amounted to uh, locker room language or shop talk and found that the conduct was sufficiently serious to attract termination. And that was in the context of a case where the employee at issue had 23 years of service and a clean record. One of the things that I found interesting in this case that 
was that this in the second bullet point, the arbitrator or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the decision maker here basically said when saying that the conduct was sufficiently serious to attract termination, he said that termination is prima facie considered to be within the range of reasonable disciplinary responses to that conduct. And there was also a discussion in the case of not only the in impact on the employee who was the subject of these slurs, but also on the broader workforce. Next slide, please. And this is a quote from a case that I thought uh, was very interesting. Here, the quote is, this, in my view, constitutes a natural evolution of arbitral thinking when it comes to eradicating workplace racism in the form of racial slurs. All employees know or are reasonably expected to know that such behavior is unacceptable in the prevailing climate that rightly calls for immediate redress of all forms of racism in the workplace. Next slide, please. In this case, uh, it deals with this idea of what's of shop talk or locker room behavior in the context of, of sexual harassment. And this is an Alberta Human Rights Commission decision. Here, the complainant was the only woman laborer working on the employer's construction site and had alleged that her direct supervisor had sexually harassed her. And there were other allegations regarding failure to promote uh, and retaliation. Here, the comments included things like, what type of guys are you into? I, we, we could never date because you're a morning person. We should date. Uh, when making, she said, making small talk, she asked him what his plans were for vacation. He talked about, would you like me to come up and we can get together? And then when she went out on a date with a boyfriend, he asked her in front of all the employees, how was your date? Uh, did you F him? I apologize for my language. And, and then said, have you ever F'd your boss? He texted her from her personal phone and referred to her construction steel toed boots as her cute little boots. Uh, there was also evidence that coworkers had discussed her appearance. So the company here argued that the comments were shop talk that was typical uh, on a construction site. And in this 2021 decision, uh, the commission made some interesting comments here. It said the very implication that sexual harassment is not sexual harassment because of the type of work location belies the fundamental principles of human rights in our province. Although some work sites may have norms that are unacceptable elsewhere, that does not mean we can ignore an objective baseline of appropriate behavior that is expected in work Alberta workplaces. If the shop talk of the work site permits sexual harassment as a norm, then the employer has a human rights responsibility to change the norm. A respondent employer is responsible and liable for the acts of sexual harassment committed by an employee. The commission also commented here that making those arguments contributed to these types of workplaces generally being seen as unwelcome to women and affecting firing. Next slide, please. This case uh, explicitly discusses uh, ex expectations of employees around symbols and how uh, symbols can change over time in terms of appropriateness. So in this case, there was a unionized uh, bottling plant employee who was fired when during COVID, he wore a mask that had a Confederate flag on it and the words, the South will rise again. The company viewed wearing this mask to be blatant racism and a violation of all its policies and terminated the employee. Uh, the union, among other arguments, argued that this behavior was on the low end of the scale and didn't warrant uh, termination. And the employee testified that he had no intention at all to offend anyone or to go against uh, the company policies. Next slide, please. The decision explicitly discussed issues of symbols in the workplace and changing understanding of those symbols over time. And the quotes here are on this slide. 
There is no doubt that the symbolic meaning of things change over time and that the Confederate flag now bears significance that may not have been obvious in society as a whole, even a few years ago. Perhaps it should always have borne the racist connotation it bears now. Societal views are changing and education seems an appropriate method of helping workers and others understand the historical meaning and reasons for the negative symbolism of the Confederate flag. The union submits that the appropriate penalty is a letter of reprimand. In earlier times, the union may well have been right. However, we are in an era of heightened awareness of systemic and individual discrimination. We live in an era where much more is being expected of companies and organizations to eliminate racism and discrimination in our diverse multicultural workplaces. That also means much more is expected of employees. So one of the things that you'll see in several of these cases where there is a discussion of increased expectation of employees, it just reinforces what David uh, has raised just a few minutes ago, which is the importance of education uh, and a broader education that we may have in the past uh, delivered when it comes to respect in the workplace. Next slide, please. In this case, the decision or the discipline rather was ultimately reduced. Uh, and there were, as I said, a lot of comments about expectations on workers. And here it talks about how the workers today must be sensitive to issues of diversity and inclusion and must take care not to act in ways that marginalize, offend, hurt, denigrate, or otherwise discriminate against others. So another illustration of broad expectations uh, from decision makers regarding both employees' behavior and employers' education and their responsibility to create a uh, discrimination and harassment free workplace. Next slide, please. This is one example of several cases where uh, in this case, the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal uh, set some basic expectations regarding the use of pronouns in terms of uh, discrimination case law. In this case, the applicant employees identified as either genderqueer or non-binary and used the they, them pronouns. The applicants here allege that the owner of the restaurant refused to use their correct pronouns as instructed and likened their request that he use their correct pronouns as requiring him to walk on eggshells. And there was also evidence that in a conversation with customers concerning the applicants, he referred to them using a transphobic, a transphobic slur. And in this case, the applicant uh, employees quit uh, this job. Next slide, please. The tribunal awarded them each $10,000 in general damages and uh, discussed the slurs and use of pronouns in their decision. They commented that the slur was made in a public setting to strangers and customers in the workplace, effectively outing the applicants and making them fear for their safety in that environment. Uh, the owner's failure to adequately respond to the applicant's concerns and investigate further constituted an adverse impact. Uh, the applicant's loss of employment was a byproduct of feeling that they had no choice, especially because the workplace had failed to respond to their concerns. And the misgendering or the use of incorrect pronouns was adverse treatment with respect to the applicant's employment. And since then, we've seen decisions uh, in other jurisdictions establishing some of the same principles. Next slide, please. I also thought it would be useful and interesting to discuss briefly the notion of unwelcome conduct or comment and the shifts and discussions we're seeing around these concepts. You know, as we know, as there's an aspect of the test for harassment, whether that's sexual harassment as a form of sexual discrimination or sexual harassment under occupational health and safety legislation, uh, around the concept of welcomeness. You know, we deal with conduct or comment that's known or should be known or reasonably to be known to be unwelcome. And there's interesting discussion, both in commentary and in academic articles, 
about this notion of proving unwelcomeness. There's discussion about whether uh, the complainants should have to establish that the conduct was unwelcome at all, or whether they should have to establish it from a reasonable person or objective person standards. And the argument goes that requiring the complainant to engage in that level of proof can allow gender-based stereotypes to enter into an analysis and invite scrutiny of the complainant's behavior. There's discussion about whether the best way or a better way to address this concept is to put a burden on the respondent to show that the conduct was unwelcome. So like a defense or a justification. Establish things like, you know, what reasonable steps did you take to uh, ensure consent? Or why was your belief in consent reasonable? Now, you may think, well, that's very interesting. Uh, that's the academic discussions, but it doesn't really impact, you know, me and cases that are deciding topics, uh, deciding this topic in the real world. But what's interesting was there was a case in 2021, this Deep Creek store case, where this whole notion and discussion that's going on about the appropriateness of where this burden falls was discussed at length. Um, now, was it part of the actual decision? No, but it was interesting that the concept was discussed over several paragraphs in this decision. Uh, and ultimately, there has been some resonance with the fact that this case, the Deep uh, Creek case, it did this analysis. And in a subsequent case, um, there was a discussion about this very same uh, in this very, this very same concept. And what it concluded was that because uh, this analysis and requiring the complainant to prove welcomeness or unwelcomeness rather, uh, allowed the introduction of gender-based myths and stereotypes, this decision maker stated that they were going to be particularly careful to guard against gender-based myths and stereotypes when considering this requirement of, of objective welcome conduct. So to me, this was another example of how increased societal, societal discussion, academic discussions are working their way into case law. Next slide, please. This health sciences case had some interesting comments on the expectation of employees and also about communicating the notion of unwelcomeness. And in this case, a griever, a woman was terminated after investigation was, uh, was undertaken uh, and she had made racist and sexually harassing comments and jokes against an Asian man. Ultimately, the case decided that termination, because she was terminated here, was not excessive. The conduct at issue here included referring to the individual as the Asian, making jokes about his language skills and his, what she said is ESL status, and making jokes uh, that were really sexual innuendo. Uh, part of the union's arguments was that uh, names like the Asian was welcome banter and that there were also uh, various mitigating factors. And there was an, also an argument that the griever uh, should not have known that this conduct was uh, unwelcome. In the decision, one of the things I found very interesting was there was an effort to distinguish a previous case where uh, the decision maker had decided that the respondent couldn't be expected to pick up on the complainant's subtle hints that the behavior was unwelcome. And it was interesting to see that in 1989, the uh, 
the subtle hints that were too subtle for a reasonable complaint or respondent to pick up on were reporting him when he asked her out saying, uh, no, I'm going with my family and acting very nervous and uncomfortable with him. Uh, the decision maker here said all that behavior was could be seen as either neutral or encouraging, which I thought was a very interesting time warp. Anyway, this decision uh, talked about how there are changing norms and how jurisprudence is developing over 30 years, that there's no circumstance when these types of demeaning jokes uh, could be considered acceptable, and that it was not the complainant's duty to tell the griever that these daily demeaning comments, for example, about his language skills were unwelcome. Due to the severity and frequency of the comments here, the decision maker held, they were inherently unwelcome. Next slide, please. The next case was interesting to me because it, the, here, the decision maker read into this reasonable person standard when it comes to welcomeness developments in society's thinking on the topic of sexual harassment. So they set out by saying Mr. Lee, who was the respondent, can only be expected to refrain from engaging in conduct which he can reasonably expected to know was unwelcome. But they then clarified that this reasonable person standard has to be grounded in the social context of complaints involving sexual harassment. And when you're in this case, when you're asking the question, well, what should you know would be unwelcome as a reasonable person? They addressed it like this. Ask yourself, what would reasonable people who have taken the trouble to inform themselves on the topic of gender myths and stereotypes know about the type of interaction that occurred. So what that meant was when dealing with the issue of consent or welcomeness, you cannot, re you cannot be imp uh, impacted by various myths and, and stereotypes. Things like lack of protest or not immediately reporting, uh, those types of things, as well as power imbalance, you cannot make the same uh, judgments on consent and welcomeness that you might have done, you know, back in 1989 or before uh, the current social context of these complaints. I wanted to finish up, next slide please, by talking about the concept of microaggressions. Again, next slide please, we're seeing more discussion about microaggressions in the workplace coming up in the course of investigations and in the case law. Uh, this case that I cite here at Alberta actually discusses the evolution of the inclusion of microaggression in case law and noted here that from 2017 until January of 2022, 11 reported cases had actually uh, referred to and analyzed microaggressions. And this court noted that even before this expression uh, was popular, uh, human rights law, as uh, David had discussed, had long recognized the phenomenon of subconscious racial bias, for example, and quoted the Peel Law uh, Association case that we're familiar with. Similarly, the Levi case that we spoke about a minute, a few minutes ago, talked about how uh, law is slow to recognize microaggressions back in 2020. Next slide, please. In this case, and this was the same one we just talked about a few minutes ago, where there were the uh, the slurs and comments and alleged jokes towards the uh, Asian man, the union had tried to argue that these were microaggressions. Uh, and in this case, the decision maker said, we're troubled by that argument. And even if they were microaggressions, they were unacceptable and wrong. And this type of banter, banter is far outside acceptable conduct. Next slide, please. In this case, uh, which involved a griever who was a sexual health counselor uh, and worked in a public health department, and there had been issues between this employee and their supervisor, uh, during a meeting, a monthly meeting at, in this health group, part of the agenda was discussing a, a WHO article about the accuracy of testing for herpes, and the supervisor made a comment to the meeting 
which included uh, two individuals who had immigrated from Africa, that the incidence of herpes in Africa uh, was among the highest incidence. And it was alleged that this was a racial microaggression. And part of the evidence suggesting that was that it had, had really been made out of context, wasn't relevant to the discussion that they were having, and rather served to embarrass the staff member uh, who had immigrated from Africa. Ultimately, though, and this goes to the application of the tests, even when the term microaggressions is used, it was found that it was not a violation of human rights law or the collective agreement because it was not a course of vexatious conduct or comment having been made only once and was not sufficiently serious to constitute a single incident of harassment. The last, uh, or these next two cases, really show how these issues are coming up in issues surrounding preliminary uh, procedures. So where a, a case has been dismissed and uh, on the grounds that something was, did not have a reasonable prospect of success, uh, or whether it's, it's not sufficiently serious to uh, be included in a case. Here, uh, it was the review of a director's decision to dismiss a human rights case, and the comments included, you know, the fact that you use Arabic text in your email makes me feel fearful, and there was, uh, you know, a touching of hair uh, of this particular uh, Black employee. And the, the court talked about how the conduct was insensitive, uh, but refused to uh, follow the decision that had been made and overturned the dismissal, which I thought was interesting because it said, we really can't assess the claim of the discriminatory, in, the, the discriminatory nature of these particular behaviors without a hearing. So here the preliminary arguments failed. Similarly, in the next case, next slide please, uh, the court here was addressing alleged microaggressions through stereotypical comments about older women and competence. And while the decision maker here said there's no prospect of success here that these, uh, that discrimination will be established, they left the comments within the case because they supported a contextual approach to the larger question. It's just to finish up, it's important to remember that where microaggressions are alleged or involved in a matter, you still need to examine the alleged conduct under the applicable statutory case law standards. This case made the comment that a complainant's speculation and, su and uh, suspicions about a microaggression does not make it a violation, uh, this is on the next slide please, of the human rights code. And recognition of the subtlety of prejudice does not transform it into a presumption of discrimination. Next slide. So in general, when you are considering uh, microaggressions, when they've come up in the workplace or in cases, it's important to remember that the focus is on the impact of the person uh, complaining, not the intent of the respondent. Uh, and making that argument is not going to be helpful. Uh, typically, in the, the cases that have discussed these, we need more than one uh, in order to have uh, an actionable matter. Uh, and where there, the common or the action is out of context, or there's no reasonable expectation offered for it, then it's more likely that the microaggression is going to be seen as problematic and potentially uh, a violation of either the company's policy or law. So to finish up with some takeaways, as David said, it is very important to make sure that your training is broad and includes the concept of microaggressions and unconscious bias. There's increasing discussion in business articles and journals about these uh, these microaggressions, for example, uh, that's been happening for the last 
a year and a half, couple of years that are very useful. And we need to make sure that both employees and supervisors understand uh, the, the these concepts. We need to train supervisors to make sure that they know how to respond so they don't accuse people of being oversensitive or laugh at an objection to something that they may feel is a microaggression and make sure that they refer it to the appropriate people within the organizations. And then lastly, where your issues involve alleged microaggressions, it's always helpful to get legal advice so you can clearly understand what is being alleged, consider the details, and then determine whether there's a violation of policy or a violation of an applicable standard. So with that, I'm going to finish up. Um, as I mentioned, we have some time for questions and uh, I will look through the questions and... Uh, and Thanks, uh, Maybe while you take a look, I know you've just been speaking, I can speak to a couple of them that have come in. Um, okay. And maybe just before I do, I'll say, I, I, you know, I think Sarah's points there at the end were a great way of bringing everything sort of full circle on this discussion. You know, the, the discussion at the start about the test and the context of prima facie discrimination and how that actually, you know, can come together with the concepts of microaggressions and subconscious bias, um, you know, and, and taking it all into consideration, uh, at least the tribunal will when making its conclusions. Um, you know, I'll start by answering one of the questions uh, that was directly related to, to something I've touched on in my presentation. One of the questions was in the case of the CFO and the alleged misconduct. Would it have helped to have investigated through an external unbiased investigator not employed by the city? Uh, and the answer I would say is yes, uh, though, again, whether it's external or whether it's internal, the real question is, you know, it, even external investigators might be impacted or, or influenced by racial stereotypes, subconscious bias without really realizing it. So, you know, you'd hope that an external investigator that you hire would not be influenced by those kind of things and, and would be able to, to be aware and, you know, come to the right conclusions and give you a more, quote, clean report. Uh, it's still possible that it could be influenced by subconscious bias. And, and so, again, even if you were to have an external investigator, it would be important to take that investigation report and, and look at it with a critical eye uh, to ensure that, that there's no racial stereotypes under, underlying it. We, we have a question here that I think is a good one that uh, points to comments within these cases that talks about, you know, you need to consider societal norms uh, and discussions currently going in, uh, 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 in going on in society. And the question I think rightly is, well, you know, what society you're referring to? Is it a global society? Is it our current society? And I think that's a very good question. It's not one that's addressed by the case law, but I think that when we're dealing with the Canadian context, um, we are the norms that they're referring to are the increased sensitivity and awareness around these issues that we have in this particular Canadian context. And I think one of the cases actually referred to the Canadian uh, the Canadian workplace. And it's reflecting, you know, discussions and awareness that have come out of things, for example, like the Me Too movement, um, where that have also impacted, you know, criminal cases where there's issues about consent and welcomeness and, and arguments you might have made 20 years ago about behavior indicating consent you would not make today. So I think that's a very, uh, a very good question. And I understand exactly, you know, where it's coming from, because it sounds like we're picking and choosing societies. But I think that the the focus in the case law, as far as I'm reading it, is the Canadian society and the developments that have happened over the past several years uh, in the areas of awareness around discrimination and harassment. And I would just add, I, I, I agree generally, Sarah, I, I would add that, you know, and I, I think, again, it is a good question. And there's differences even amongst, you know, regions in Canada. And we've heard, you know, with Raphael's presentation, you know, there's some differences in Quebec from the rest of the country, but even, you know, we haven't gone into it, but as as between, you know, if you want to talk about society and expectations, I would suggest there's differences between provinces, other provinces. There's also differences between regions of provinces. So within BC, there'd be differences, you know, in, in 
society's perspective in, in the Lower Mainland versus, say, in, in Northern BC that could be drawn. When I, when I read the, the decision in Campbell uh, of the tribunal, I would suggest that, that, you know, it's the BC Human Rights Tribunal will consider BC and the societal context in BC, which may be similar to Ontario in a lot of ways, but may not be similar to, you know, some of the other areas, some of the other provinces, and it would be a liberal perspective they would take within BC. So, um, you know, a, a, an informed view to human rights. So it, it, I do, you know, think that's a very good question. Um, and, you know, it's Canadian generally, but even more narrow in certain circumstances. There was another question about whether the, you know, the, the norms of the workplace extend to customer behavior and expectations around how customers uh, behave for example, in a, in a particular, uh, you know, workplace, uh, you know, many of the policies that uh, my clients work with have the standards applying to those who come into the workplace and uh, protect their employees from potentially abusive uh, conduct from vendors or customers uh, in those policies. Uh, David, do you have any any comments about that, about whether these norms that we expect uh, would uh, include customers? Yeah, I, I, I think they would. I, you know, an organization who, you know, if a customer comes in and is to act inappropriately, discriminate against, um, you know, an, an employee, then the organization is going to ultimately be held responsible. And so in terms of the expectations, you know, obviously a, an organization can't train all its customers on subconscious bias or microaggressions, but it would have a duty to ensure it does everything it can, I think, to prevent uh, its employees from being subject to that kind of conduct. So what that means, you know, possibly, you know, putting up signage, you see it in some places in terms of respectful behavior and these sorts of things. Um, and, and recognizing organizations can only do so much. But I would say it would extend to, uh, you know, whatever reasonable protections can be put in place against conduct by customers. Thank you, David. Uh, well, I'm being mindful of everyone's time and seeing that it's 1.30, I wanted to close the uh, presentation today. Thank you from me and from all of uh, our speakers today for joining us. Uh, just a reminder, please fill in that survey. As David said, we really value your input. So if you haven't already done it, you know, please do so. Just to let you know, our next LEHR event is going to be at the end of October. So keep an eye on uh, your inbox for that invitation. And if you go to the Faskin Institute section of Faskin.com, you can see all the various events that we'll be hosting over the next little while. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we hope this is helpful and have a good afternoon.